Thanks to Surfshark VPN for supporting this video. More on them later. How do you calculate functions like e to the x, sine of x, or cosine of x at any given x value? Like, how might your calculator do it? This is a very old and classic question, and if you've taken a calculus course, you might already know the very common technique for doing this that I'm about to show. But even if you do, please stick with me, because there's a nuance to it we're going to explore that you may not have thought about. The basic idea is to approximate the function near an input value where the function and its derivatives are easy to calculate. Let's take e to the x as our example function. e to the x is easy to calculate at x equals 0, since anything to the 0 power is 1. And if you know a little calculus, you might know that all the derivatives of e to the x are just copies of itself. So all its derivatives are also easy to evaluate at x equals 0, and they're all equal to 1. Using this information about e to the x near x equals 0, we can approximate the value of e to the x near there. We can start with a linear approximation, approximating e to the x near x equals 0 with a linear function. This amounts to finding the formula for the tangent line of the curve at x equals 0, since a tangent line gives the best possible linear approximation for a function around the point of tangency, since it matches two properties of the curve at that point. Its value, or height, above the x-axis, and its slope, or derivative there. In other words, the best linear approximation of a function at a point is one whose value and derivative both match those of the function at that point. Now, the value of e to the x at x equals 0 is just 1, and the same goes for its derivative. So the ideal linear approximation for e to the x near x equals 0 is just the function 1 plus x. From here, we can improve the approximation by using a higher degree polynomial. A linear approximation is good, but a quadratic approximation is better. And the best quadratic approximation of a function near a point is one that matches the function's value, derivative, and second derivative at that point. Since all these values are 1 at x equals 0 for e to the x, the best quadratic approximation of it is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 where we have to divide by 2 here to compensate for the factor of 2 that will pop out when taking the derivative of x squared. You can probably guess what comes next. If a quadratic approximation is better than a linear, then a cubic approximation will be better than a quadratic, and a quartic will be better still, and so on. The higher the degree of polynomial we use, the more higher order derivative information about the curve we can incorporate into it, yielding a better and better approximation until in the limit we get what's known as the Taylor series, or Taylor expansion, of e to the x around x equals 0. And at this point, the series doesn't just approximate the function near x equals 0, but actually equals it for all x values for which the Taylor series converges. And it just so happens that the Taylor series for e to the x at x equals 0 converges for all possible values of x meaning e to the x precisely equals its Taylor series for all values of x both near and far away from x equals 0. Thus we have a way to calculate the value of e to the x at any possible x value to any precision we care. We just plug in whatever value we need into the Taylor expansion of e to the x, and by adding up enough of the terms, we can get an arbitrarily good approximation of it there. For example, by plugging in x equals 0.32 into the expansion, I can get an approximation of e to the power of 0.32 good to 5 decimal places just by adding 6 terms. Well, what do you think? A pretty simple and logical technique, isn't it? Well, actually, absolutely not! In fact, it's ridiculous and shouldn't work at all! We'll take a look at why in a moment. But first, a quick message from this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network that protects your personal information while online by hiding your location from websites that try to track you and collect information about you, as well as helping ensure all data you send and receive is encrypted. And if you're worried about any personal information that may already be loose, Surfshark's alert feature lets you check for potential breaches of that data. Beyond boosting your online security, Surfshark allows you to change your virtual location, which can be helpful if you do a lot of international traveling, as you can enjoy the comforts of your home country's internet while abroad. A single subscription to Surfshark also covers unlimited devices, so you can make sure everything's covered. 
To get started, head to surfshark.deal slash morphocular, or click the link in the description, and enter the promo code morphocular, and you'll get a holiday special offer of 5 additional free months with the Surfshark 1 package. And now back to the video. While it's true that these Taylor polynomials will approximate the behavior of e to the x near x equals 0 to some extent, and will further improve as we use higher degree polynomials, there's no reason to assume beforehand that the approximation will improve to arbitrary precision as we keep going, and ultimately reach perfect equality in the limit. The reason why not is actually pretty simple. These polynomial approximations were constructed only using local information about the function at x equals 0. Think about it. The only data that went into constructing these polynomials were the value and derivatives of e to the x at the singular input x equals 0, and yet somehow it's enough to reproduce the entire curve everywhere else. If I were to, say, contort the function into oblivion outside of an interval around x equals 0, even a very small interval, the function would still report the same value and derivative information at x equals 0 meaning the Taylor series would be unchanged even though I've twisted the function beyond recognition everywhere except for a tiny island surrounding x equals 0. But it gets even worse. You might suppose that even though the Taylor series are built using local information near a point, we could perhaps still expect the Taylor series to perfectly equal the function at least in some very small interval surrounding the point of expansion. After all, my trick with contorting the e to the x function relied on me not messing with the function within a small island of x equals 0, even though that island could be arbitrarily small. But it turns out even this modest proposition fails. There are smooth functions whose Taylor expansions around a point are not equal to the function on any interval surrounding the expansion point, no matter how small. A classic example is the piecewise function given by g of x equals e to the negative 1 over x for positive x values, and 0 otherwise. This function and all its derivatives are actually equal to 0 at x equals 0, meaning its Taylor expansion at x equals 0 is just the constant function 0. But the function g is non-zero for any positive value of x, meaning it doesn't equal its Taylor expansion anywhere to the right of x equals 0. That's one example, but there are others actually many others. In fact, not only do such weird functions exist, but they are, in some sense, extremely common. Functions that truly equal their Taylor expansions on any interval are the exception, not the rule. So it's actually kind of a miracle that e to the x, and also sine of x, cosine of x, and pretty much all the regular kinds of functions you'll encounter in your mathematical life, actually perfectly equal their Taylor series anywhere beyond the point of expansion. Why? What is it about these functions that enable them to actually perfectly equal their local Taylor expansions more globally? The answer has to do with how quickly the higher order derivatives grow as their order increases. You see, there's a theorem called Taylor's theorem that allows us to measure how much error there is between a given Taylor polynomial approximation and the original function over a given interval. Specifically, it says that if you take the nth degree Taylor polynomial expansion of a function f about an input point x0, then the error in your approximation at another input x, often called the remainder, is given by the n plus 1 derivative of f evaluated at some value t between x0 and x, divided by n plus 1 factorial, times x minus x0 to the power n plus 1. That's admittedly a bit to process. But the main thing to pay attention to is that the error of the Taylor approximation at a point x depends on the value of the next higher derivative of f somewhere between x and the expansion point x0. So for example, the error of the second degree Taylor polynomial of f at x will depend on how large the third derivative of f gets between x and x0. In our case, where f of x is the exponential function e to the x, and the expansion point is x0 equals 0, the factor depending on the n plus 1 derivative of f just becomes e to the t, since every derivative of e to the x is just a copy of itself. The critical thing to notice about this expression is that the factor coming from the n plus 1 derivative of e to the x can be bounded independently of n. 
Since t is somewhere between x and x0, e to the t must be somewhere between e to the x and e to the x0, neither of which depends on n. Thus, as we increase the order of our Taylor approximation, that is, as we increase n toward infinity, this entire remainder term approaches zero since the n plus 1 factorial in the denominator will overpower the geometric factor of x to the n plus 1 in the numerator, and the e to the t factor can't do anything to stop it, since it's bounded between two constants. Thus, as n increases, the remainder, or error, of the Taylor approximation approaches zero. And so we can safely say the Taylor series converges exactly to the original function e to the x at all x values. So the key to why the e to the x function, and also functions like sine of x and cosine of x, equal their Taylor series is because their higher order derivatives grow much slower than n factorial as you increase the derivative order n. In fact, their higher order derivatives don't grow at all. They stay bounded as n increases. This isn't the case with our pathological example of e to the negative 1 over x, whose derivatives near x equals 0 appear to grow faster than factorial speed as the derivative order increases. In fact, the closer x is to 0, the faster the higher derivatives seem to grow. Now functions like e to the x sine of x and cosine of x that equal their Taylor expansions near x equals 0, as well as near any other expansion point in their domains, have a special name. They're called analytic functions, and I hope you can now appreciate just what a rare and special property this is. Yet almost all functions you're likely to work with on a regular basis are analytic. Part of the reason for this is analytic functions can be built out of other analytic functions very easily. In general, any arithmetic combination or function composition of analytic functions results in another analytic function. So once we've established that the fundamental functions like e to the x, sine, cosine, polynomials, etc. are analytic, any new functions we build algebraically with them will be analytic too. By contrast, the piecewise function we built out of e to the negative 1 over x is an example of a function that is not analytic, even though it is smooth, that is, even though it has derivatives of all orders at all points in its domain. This function is one of the proofs that just because a function is smooth doesn't mean it's analytic. You might feel kind of bummed out that this can happen, but the good news is there is a world where such horrible non-analytic smooth functions can never appear, and that's in the complex plane. Functions that take complex number inputs and outputs have a slightly different notion of derivative that extends the real number version, and for these functions, the concepts of smooth and analytic coincide. If a complex valued function has derivatives of all orders in an open region of the complex plane, it's automatically analytic there too. But it gets even better. It turns out that if a complex valued function merely has a first derivative on some open region of the complex plane, then it automatically has all higher order derivatives on that region too. That is, having one derivative on an open region automatically makes it smooth there. A complex function that has a first derivative everywhere on an open region of the complex plane is called holomorphic, and the fact that holomorphic functions are automatically smooth and therefore analytic is one of the deep theorems of complex analysis, and is one of the main differences between it and real analysis. Because of this, functions in the complex plane often behave much more nicely than functions on the real line, as there are fewer edge cases to worry about when working with them. Yet another example of the great irony that complex numbers make everything simpler. Now even though I've painted non-analytic smooth functions as the pathological villains of real analysis, they've actually got some redeeming qualities that are quite important. For example, the piecewise e to the negative 1 over x function we looked at earlier can be used to build a so-called bump function. A function which is zero everywhere except for a small island but is still smooth even at the boundary where it transitions from being zero to non-zero. Bump functions have a number of important uses. In fact, I used one myself in a previous video when I wanted to perturb a function in a very localized area, but didn't want to break smoothness at the boundaries because that can make numerical derivative algorithms behave unstably. In the end, there's a lot more to Taylor series and approximating functions than first meets the eye. 
And I hope saying all this has made your mind more analytic, and will make any further study you do less bumpy and just a smoother experience on the whole.